During a recent appearance on Real Time with Bill Maher, ex-Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger shut down dishonest MAGA talking points that convicted felon Donald Trump was somehow tough on Vladimir Putin and even seemed to disagree with Maher himself when he did. But before we unpack all that, if you end up liking this video and you want to support the channel, please be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and alert bells before you go. All right, friends, we have several clips to look at in this video. And I should say out the gate that we typically hear a pondering politics focus on electoral politics and domestic policy rather than foreign policy. I have a degree in political science, but foreign policy is by far my weakest area of quote unquote expertise. However, I did find this uh, conversation between Adam Kinzinger and Bill Maher really illustrative because it also dovetails into electoral politics. There is a very common talking point that convicted felon Donald Trump was somehow tough on authoritarians like uh, Kim Jong-un of North Korea and Vladimir Putin in Russia. And Adam Kinzinger, who used to be a Trump supporter, he was a Republican congressman representing Illinois' uh, 16th district. And I just I love po pointing this out because even though he opposes Trump now, when Trump was president, Kinzinger not only voted for Trump, but he voted with Trump as a member of Congress 90% of the time. So this was not a rhino by any stretch of the imagination. Now, after the January 6th insurrection, he turned against Trump as well he should. I digress. But the bottom line is this man knows his Republican politics and he knows Donald Trump. And with that in mind, the conversation turned to, you know, a contrast between Donald Trump's posture with respect to Russia compared to President Biden's. And I thought this was really illustrative. So we're going to play the clip and unpack it together. Um, I think it shows I think it shows that Russia is increasingly desperate. The front lines have stabilized in Ukraine. The weapons gap is shortening and he has to go to North Korea to beg for weapons. And what we find out today is South Korea is thinking about opening up their arsenal of 155, which is artillery rounds. Uh, so this is really a bad look for Vladimir Putin. And I think it just goes to prove he is simply trying to buy time to see if Donald Trump wins in November. And he's doing it at the cost of his people's lives. Well, I think that's a pretty charitable way to look at it from our point of view. From his point of view, uh, he's getting the, the, we thought we could cut him off. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that there were plenty of people in the world who said, no, we'll take your business. Yeah. He's getting his weapons from China and North Korea and Iran and all the people who don't like us for various reasons seem to be getting together. But that's what happens. See, that's the difference between when you do have a president, love him or, or don't love him, Biden at least is doing some pushing back against this axis. And so they are driven into each other's arms out of desperation. Russia has to go because he has had economic impacts. Donald Trump was lit. This is what drives me nuts is when the GOP say he didn't invade under Donald Trump. It's Ronald Reagan that said we can have peace and we can have it tomorrow. Surrender. And that's what Donald Trump basically did was giving these people everything they wanted. He went to North Korea and wrote about love letters with Kim Jong Un. Right. So, yeah, they're coming together. But that's at a result of a stronger U.S. foreign policy. OK, what what uh... again? That is from a former Trump supporting Republican congressman who, by the way, is a veteran himself. So he tends to focus on foreign policy issues and he has direct firsthand experience. OK, now the context for all of this is that Russia and North Korea recently signed a mutual defense partnership, the details of which we do not know at this time, or at least the public doesn't know now. To Kinzinger's point, the only reason that these two countries would do this is because of the pressure that they are facing from the Western alliance led by President Biden, right? They would not be running to each other's arms, as Kinzinger says, if there wasn't severe economic pressure and incentive to do so. This didn't happen in a vacuum. It's because pressure was applied that they're seeking refuge with one another. Um, in more than two decades, as both countries face increasing, increasing animosity from Western countries, including the U.S., the deal with political, economic, and military cooperation could be the strongest between Moscow and Pyongyang since the end of the Cold War. Details are not immediately clear. Putin's visit also underscored his country's reliance on the pariah state for munitions to fuel its ongoing war with Ukraine, which has support from its own allies. Now, in contrast, or excuse me, in response to this, I've got another clip, a couple more clips to play. Um, there was recently a, I should say, before this North Korea-Russia mutual defense treaty, President Biden and the Biden administration seemed to anticipate this. And so they worked very hard to establish a trilateral uh, aid and alliance of their own between the United States, South Korea and Japan. Japan, South Korea, historically speaking, having frosty relationships. OK, so in response to the recent developments between Russia and North Korea, the foreign minister of South Korea said that uh, 
uh, they are going to closely cooperate with the United States and Japan uh, through timely dialogue, they said, after uh, the Moscow and Pyongyang summit. OK, so basically this trilateral alliance uh, in the South Pacific is paying close attention to what's going on between Putin, uh, Putin and Kim Jong Un. Now, I also wanted to play another clip of Adam Kinzinger as well. Uh, I think I covered this in a previous video as well, but it's just it's important to really emphasize. We're going to play a couple of clips of Kinzinger and John Bolton, these infamously, you know, war hawk uh, Republican national security advisor who served Donald Trump. And both Kinzinger and Bolton, Bolton especially, hawkish, but both of them as former Trump supporting Republicans are openly critical of Donald Trump's foreign policy and have gone to exhaustive lengths to debunk the notion that Donald Trump was tough on foreign authoritarians. So we're going to play some of these clips and unpack them together. This is Kinzinger. Hey, just want to do a quick video. I'm, I'm seeing everybody, well, people like probably Marjorie Taylor Greene. I haven't seen her, but she probably is. But J.D. Vance and other people on the Twitter sphere and on the media saying things like, you know, Donald Trump... Uh, was doing such a great job of deterring Iran. Here's some quick reminders. Okay, we killed Soleimani. Good job. I actually give Trump credit for that. That was a good hit. Iran responded by launching a whole bunch of missiles at a U.S. base uh, in Iraq. A hundred soldiers were injured with traumatic brain injuries. Remember Donald Trump said, oh, they're just some headaches? Yeah, not to those people. It's serious. How did we respond to that missile barrage against our base? We did nothing. Do you remember when they shot down a hundred million something dollar drone, which by the way is not like a little drone. It's about the size of an airliner. And we responded by, oh, that's right. Trump did nothing. Do you remember when they attacked the Saudi oil field with a massive barrage? Uh, Trump responded by, that's right. He didn't do anything. Do you remember when he said we were going to leave the Kurds behind? Remember when he kept talking about leaving Syria and leaving Syria to Iran? Yeah, let's be clear about Donald Trump. I have my disagreements with this administration, but let's quit pretending Donald Trump was anything but the worst foreign policy president of my generation, because he was. And again, it goes on like that. He lists off a number of examples that Republicans tend to memory hole because they want to feed this notion that Donald Trump, who postures as a strong man who postures as tough, and certainly he's reckless and ruthless in his own way, but he's also quite thin-skinned. He's the ultimate snowflake, and when it comes to Putin in particular, he seems to have a soft spot for him, as well as Kim Jong-un. And John Bolton, Donald Trump's own former national security advisor, an expert in national security, is why Trump hired him, and who's quite hawkish, somebody who, in he would tell you, believes in a strong foreign policy in which you try to intimidate the opposition. Uh, this is what Bolton had to say with respect to, uh, actually in this particular clip, is in the aftermath of reporting about the uh, newfound alliance between Putin and Kim Jong-un. Ambassador Bolton, former President Trump said in an interview tonight, he once again praised Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader. And this comes right after Vladimir Putin and Kim just struck this week a defense deal. I wonder, you know, what does the alliance uh, between you know, Kim and Putin look like if Trump is elected again. And he seems to constantly want to butter up this dictator. Well, uh, the, the, the Putin-Kim meeting in, uh, in Korea was really a get together of two of the people in the world Donald Trump considers his best friends. Remember, he said of Kim Jong-un, we fell in love and he was happy about that. So when you see that military partnership, that relationship, uh, the security relationship between Moscow and Pyongyang progressing, and you see the unity, the public display of unity uh, behind Moscow's war against Ukraine, uh, th this is definitely something to be worried about. I mean, you hear a lot of uh, Trump advocates uh, trying to reassure people, saying the second term is not going to look like the first term. It's going to be a rational foreign policy. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I think that they're uh, deceiving people, perhaps unconsciously, perhaps hoping. But hope isn't a strategy when it comes to Trump. Th this is the look of American foreign policy, and it's not going to be. 
Yeah. So again, that's a guy who worked for Donald Trump very closely. And there's a really good Washington Post op-ed about this, and it's two years old, but this was after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And it talks about how John Bolton went on a crusade to debunk Trump's revisionist history. When former President Donald Trump hasn't been praising Putin's strategic savvy in invading Ukraine or conspicuously and repeatedly declining to morally judge Putin for it, he's generally fallen back on one talking point, that this wouldn't have happened if he were still in charge. It carries the benefit of both being plausible to legions of Trump supporters who believe far less plausible things involving Trump, as well as being largely unfalsifiable. And yet all along, one of his top former foreign policy aides has sought with increasing gusto to make sure this claim doesn't go unchallenged. Yes, Trump's former national security advisor, John Bolton, has turned on Trump like many others in Trump's inner orbit. Okay, His understanding of events is therefore understandably uncharitable. But if there were one thing that would seemingly earn the gratitude of an uber hawk like Bolton, pretty high on that list would be Trump's supposed success in keeping Bolton in check, or keeping Putin in check. Bolton has now said repeatedly that this isn't how it went down. He's made quite the opposite case, that Putin didn't do stuff like this during Trump's presidency because Trump was already doing the work for him, specifically by undermining NATO. And it's a case that tracks with plenty of what we already knew, even as few Trump allies turned critics have seen fit to publicly weigh in. In almost every case, because this is the thing you hear a lot about, that in the Trump administration, there were sanctions imposed on Russia. And so this is what Bolton had to say. In almost every case, the sanctions were imposed with Trump complaining about it, saying we were being too hard. Okay. And actually, on that score, I want you to see an exchange. This is, again, two years old, but the the facts remain what they are because this is Bolton explaining to Newsmax after Russia's invasion of Ukraine that Donald Trump was not hard on Putin. And to the extent that the Trump administration was ever hard on Putin or Russia, it was over Trump's objections. I mean, he took a very tough stance against Russia. I'm surprised you don't think that he would have handled no, this better didn't. than Joe Biden. No, he, he, he did not. He did not. How did we he didn't not? sanction Nord Stream 2. We, did, we didn't sanction Nord Stream 2. We should have. We should have brought the project to an end. Uh, we did impose sanctions on Russian oligarchs and, and several others because of their sales of S-400 uh, anti-aircraft systems to other countries. But in almost every case, the sanctions were imposed with Trump uh, uh, complaining about it and saying we were being too hard. Uh, the fact is that uh, he barely knew where Ukraine was. He once asked John Kelly, his second chief of staff, if Finland were a part of Russia. Uh, it's just not accurate to say that Trump's behavior somehow uh, deterred the Russians. I, I think the evidence but then, is then, but that then Russia what did? didn't feel... Let, let me finish now. Yeah, okay. Didn't feel, didn't feel that their military was ready. Right. So Bolton, again, a national security expert who is very conservative, very hawkish, served Republicans, served Trump, says actually this whole nonsense, this whole unfalsifiable nonsense by Trump is contradicted by the facts at hand that the sanctions imposed were over Trump's objections. He was whining that they were being too mean to Putin. Many of the claims are just outright lies, like sanctioning the Nord Stream 2 project. And also, according to Bolton and many others, the reason, one of the reasons that Putin didn't invade Ukraine during the Trump administration is because he was in the midst of a military buildup that he didn't think he was militarily ready to do so, to say nothing of the rhetoric that Trump, as the leader of NATO, effectively was engaging in to undermine NATO, right? So why invade before your military is ready and when your ostensible opponent is undermining the credibility and the coherence of your other opponents? That might explain why Putin didn't invade. So the reason we're talking about this is just I think it's worthwhile to try to debunk these right wing talking points uh, that rely on, you know, deception and revisionist history. And I think it says something that when the likes of John Bolton and Adam Kinzinger, former Trump supporting Trump loyal Republicans, that they're leading the charge on this. Maybe that says something. Speaking of saying something, let me know what you think in the comments.